poking around in my email, when did I meet Rick? And I think it was back in like September of 2018 um, when I was a volunteer at ADA, Attention Deficit Disorder Association, and you had come forward to share uh, some of the work you're doing here at Renify and lead, you know, a financial, I think a series of three with a webinar kickoff, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the first thing that stood out about Rick different from all other finance folks in the ADD universe was not afraid. There was so much fear about giving advice. I think that you understood so much about the drivers that you didn't get caught up in this worried concern. Oh, I'm going to give advice. And what if it's wrong? You, you never were worried about that. And I just loved how really accessible and warm and open. Um, and I, I think that that's my first impression seems to have been proven out over the last few years. Um, so we met way back in 2018 over the internet. And then I don't think we even saw each other in person until later that fall at the conference that year. Um, so I'm so glad to have met you because now we spend a lot more time together um, here at Renify. Uh, what, what are we going to be talking about tonight? The head oh, honcho. I see. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think the selected topic was was why time management is not really about time management. You know, there's, there's deeper things going on there. I yeah. think that part's really good. And as far as the advice, I don't know if I, I give advice, but I, I give you know things that I see out there. And I really believe in the the saying that when a student's ready, a teacher appears. The lessons are all the way out there. They're always out there. And we take the ones we want and we leave the rest behind. And maybe two years later, something that didn't resonate back then resonates. So when we're ready to see stuff, we see it. And if it's advice that doesn't resonate with someone, they're just not going to use it. That's all. And, and you know, we're all different. What, what do they say? We're you're a unique person, just like every other person on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> but we do we are unique i mean there is there are unique identifiers um we know we all have different fingerprints even if you are a twin you have a different fingerprint and i've dated a european and i know they always like those pictures their passport pictures have your ear your ear is different so yes there's a there's the dna we, we have a humanness that we have in common but we are we do have different histories and um ways of being that are unique to each of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So when is time management not time management? I love the, the I, I like the, when the, when is that thing not the thing? When is that? So when is the time management not about time management? Well, I guess the way I see it and kind of recently came to this, but um, it's kind of an extension of the things that we talked about at Renify, but the, the problem for most people that they think is time management really isn't. And, and I would say the reason we, the proof of that really, if, if it was just about time management, you would just throw away the daytime that you're having right now that's not working and you go buy another one that did something slightly different. And then you would manage your time with that one. If it were that mechanical, just like a, a budget, right? If it was just about putting numbers on a page and then following them, no one would have a money problem. If it was just about, calories in calories out nobody would have a weight problem right these are not these are the symptoms of the problem these are not the actual problem so when we think that you know we beat ourselves up because hey i put that thing on my my to-do list for the last 17 days in a row and it's still not done or i promised myself last night that i would get this done by two o'clock today and it's not done you know really maybe it's getting done but i just really hate doing it or whatever it happens to be that's really not a time management problem there's an emotional underlying current that's that's running through that's causing that it, it we don't i mean we do of course we always forget things once in a while but it's not about forgetting it's 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 just not okay so the when the time management is like we like to think about it as time management because it could be i'll just change the system or i'll tweak this system but i feel like what i'm hearing is okay you put that thing on your list or on your calendar and somehow it's the third time and it's still not done or, or more maybe. And then I wanted to throw out there to folks, are there those things? It's, you know, if you could think about three word phrase that is those things that we're avoiding. And it could be like, oh, the air conditioner filters or 
the oil change in the car or going to the post office to get stamps or um, I don't know, doing our taxes on time. Or, but there are those things that we'll put on the list and maybe we, you know, hey, I'll, what if I make it red on my calendar? Now I'll do it. So we think maybe if there's just another way we remind ourselves that it'll get better. Is there, anybody can put in there, in the chat, things that, I use the word vex. Because I, I don't think they just irk us. I think vex um, that they just, you know, there's something about them that still keep popping up. Like it just isn't quite done. It just keeps coming back up over and over. So I think typically the things that don't get done that we think we want to do, and, and genuinely we do feel that we want to get them done, there's almost always an, an emotional undercurrent to that, right? I, I want to get my my taxes done, but oh, it just seems so overwhelming, and and I get anxious about it, and I don't know if I'll have the money to pay them, and and I you know I failed to get them paid on time for the last four years in a row. I'm probably going to do that again. I must you know something wrong with me. I mean, really, when you don't have when your ADHD is not remediated, that's the place where people get to where they think there's something wrong with them, and there may be something wrong with the expression and and getting things done and being able to function in the world. There's nothing wrong functionally with them as a, as a human being. Um, and that, again, it goes to the same place. Weight issues are not a character issue. Money problems are not a character issue. And neither is having difficulty managing our time. But that thing that you said about where we'll go with it, right? You know, you think you're looking around and the other people are being able to get it, it done, but we don't really know. But we sort of project that these other folks can get it done. And then we think, oh, is there something really different or wrong about me? Right. Why is this? Why can't I just fill in the blank? Right. And that immediately turning in on ourselves. Mm, right. With so something we judgy. Right. It's judgy. We, we typically that. get those judgments uh, very early on in our lives, right? Because we're in trouble in school and whatever it happens to be. And we tend to, you know, this is cliche now, but we tend to judge our insides by someone else's outsides. They look like everything is together. It looks like they've got everything going perfectly. And we know internally, even though we're not showing it, that things aren't going internally, aren't going very well for us. Um, and if you take the reciprocal of that, that person who might be struggling internally is looking at us and saying, hey, they must have their act together. Everything is, you know, must be easy for them. So that, I think that's a huge problem is that, is that we internalize negative judgments very early on as children in school. And then at some point, we don't need anybody else telling us that we're, we're lazy or irresponsible. We're, we've got that tape playing in our head and we have to, we have to erase it and put something better in its place. Um, you know, I, I hear people in some of the success clinics with Chad talking about how people say, you know, horrible things to them. And I'm sure it does happen sometimes, but most of the time it's the person playing some tape in their own head, reinterpreting something that someone said to them. And I'm sure if they asked what that person's innocent intent was, it had nothing to do with putting them down in any way, but they reinterpret that tape based on something from their past. So we do get emotionally wrapped up in these things. And it's, we do. We, it, it is very emotional. It's really interesting. That was what I liked about when we first met, that there wasn't this, you didn't have this worry about, I'm going to give financial advice, because you kind of knew the finance stuff was, there was an emotional underneath it. There was something emotional about it. Um, and so time management or these task avoidance, maybe, these things you're saying also have an emotional element to them. Yeah, if we're avoiding something, we're not just avoiding it at random. We're avoiding something. If we look back at the things we have trouble managing in our in our schedules, there's there's a pattern to it. You know, I I don't know. I never have I never have trouble getting to the store in time to fill up the refrigerator when it's getting empty. I never have trouble with that. I don't I don't need to avoid that. I'm not afraid of going into the grocery store or anything like that. Um, so well, I'm leave COVID out of it for now. So, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, but if it's something else that I feel I may be judged on, or maybe I don't know if I can do it well enough to be, you know, the past, then, then I get a little bit afraid of that. I get anxious. I become avoidant. 
But we, we don't just avoid things to be avoiding them. We avoid things because there's some underlying emotional reason why we're, we don't want to face that. Well, it's interesting some of the things in the chat that people avoid, like making a new doctor's appointment. And I have to say, I changed insurance right around the pandemic, and I've never met the new doctor. So, um, you know, some health thing is becoming like, I really need to pay attention to it. I think it had to do with the anxiety of meeting this new doctor, someone you kind of need to be intimate with when I already had an established relationship. But see, that's right into what you're saying, that there's an emotional element to it. And to me, like the grocery store is that hunting and gathering, the game of filling the cart. I, you know, I have a paper list, I'm looking at it. So it's, it's got a fun element to me. So we're not avoiding the things that we're either interested in or have a fun element. There is some like a magnet, something that is repelling to us about it, something that we have some emotional feelings around. So how do we go about the examining the emotions? Cause that's also, I noticed like, I'm not, if it's not a fun emotion, I'm a little not interested in getting too deep into it myself. I think it's I think it's both an attraction and a repelling, right? I, I think there's things that we are trying genuinely to avoid, and then there's other things that are just off to the side within our peripheral view, and so that would really be much more exciting. I'm going to go do that. And when we postpone something that we're anxious about, we don't take the emotions with it, right? If, if I'm postponing writing a blog, for example, I have emotions that say, I don't know if I can do it good enough, I don't know if people are going to judge it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a little anxiety to that. So now I decide, well, you know what? I'm going to go, I don't know, take a walk instead because there's no anxiety, you know, it's high pressure to low pressure. So I do that. But I rationalize it to myself saying, you know what? I'll feel like doing that blog tomorrow. There's no problem. I have, I, I have time between one o'clock and two o'clock. I'll write it tomorrow. I don't take the emotions onto the tomorrow's deal. I look at it tomorrow as a mechanical thing. Of course, I have an hour. It'll take me an hour. Of course, I'll get it done. The problem is tomorrow when it's one o'clock and I'm starting to write it, all those emotions show up again. As a matter of fact, they're a little worse because now I'm a day late, later than I would have been. Um, it's so it, it's it starts to amp up, right? The more you put it off, it's got some emotional, like let's use like a storm category, category one, right? Mm -hmm. Once you put it back in the to-do list somehow a second time, it sort of gets to be like a category 1.5. Now it has a little more heft well and, yeah and and another thing that's uh, also emotional a it, it, little bit of time blindness in there right it, it's either now or not now if it's not now it's irrelevant almost so when we look at things and we put them on our calendar because rationally we say you know we really should get that done i really should i really should get you know my my third quarter taxes done i really should get that you know handled um, but it's not on fire. It, it's not a huge problem. And, you know, somebody else has sent me an email and I think I should respond to that. Or somebody said something to me on Facebook and I'm really upset about it. So I have to answer that some social media thing. There's a lot of things that suddenly seem urgent in the moment and they overshadow these things that are important, but they're not necessarily urgent to do them right now. And so we push them in the back burner. Um, so again, it's not a time management thing. Our, our rational mind said, get ready for third quarter taxes. Our emotional mind says, somebody said something sideways to me on social media and I got to go respond to that, right? Yeah. What I felt like I heard you saying was, I sometimes feel like it's an ADHD voice in my mind, the putting it off till tomorrow or the, with no reminders and no scaffolding, I'll remember it. Like, I feel like, Mirage was a word I heard you say around this voice. Um, so this idea of I can do it tomorrow, like tomorrow is green pasture and there's plenty of time for things to happen in tomorrow. Um, but the scaffolding, how is it, how is it going to come into being when we, after we've sort of told ourselves that story about I, I can do that tomorrow. Well, I, th I think, I'm not sure about scaffolding right now, but I think the okay. thing happens is we say, okay, that project will take an hour. This other one will take two hours. This, this other one is an hour and a half. We add all that up as if we were going to have our best day tomorrow. 
and no emotions getting in the way. And so we say, okay, okay, it's tomorrow, it's eight o'clock, I'm going to get started. And all of a sudden the emotions start getting in and suddenly we're off track and get completely demoralized by that. So part of it is put a whole lot less on our plate and realize that yes, mechanically, time managing, I could do all those things in the time that was in it. If I were a completely robotic creature with no emotions, I could do all those easy. I could even do them quicker than what I have written down there probably. So, but we have this huge headwind that happens and we do talk about Jonathan Haidt's elephant and rider metaphor where the elephant is the emotional mind and the rider is the 140 pound person on the top, you know, that later came later on evolution that helps us be rational. Well, that rational mind doesn't have a chance unless we get the emotional mind in order, in, you know, aligned in a sense. And so if we ignore it and say, yeah, mechanically I could do all these things, where it's it's doomed to fail and then we have another you know failed day on our hands and we feel badly about it and then we replay the tapes that say hey we were just lazy right we go back to i've disappointed myself before and i'm going to do it again right that, that thing we've done before right we uh there's something really interesting in the chat that i want to read out uh i learned i have to consider the emotions of future me Mm -hmm. um That's right. tomorrow me and make their life easier if i can or rather preventing them from panicking or worse or feeling worse it's hard to do in practice but it does help so this reminds me of um you know having a pocketbook that has room for uh oh headache medicine right in case you have a headache or your lip balm or a uh, replacement pantyhose if you live someplace where that's a, a thing that you might need right but having um a little bit of planning right i you know carrying your sweater with you because the place you might go to dinner might have air conditioning so this idea of future you not ruining future you's day i love that love that way of thinking um and i think there's another piece of this too and that's belief in ourselves we were kind of headed in that direction a little Ooh. bit which is why i think to-do lists can be so damaging to us we we put seven things or ten things on the list and we do seven and then we feel badly because we didn't do three of them and frequently those are the most emotionally attached ones which is you know makes them probably pretty important so when we when we do that day after day we really look in the mirror at someone who lies to themselves and someone who doesn't get things done right and so of course you're going to have that identity and the next time, you know, push comes to shove and you got a lot of things on your plate, you say, yeah, I, I know myself. There's no way I'm going to get all that done. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you're, if that's your identity, that you don't get things done, that's exactly what's going to happen. We, we can't escape it. I don't know what else, any better way to say it. You can't escape your identity. You can change it. You can become the person who gets things done. You can have that belief in yourself. But in order to do that, you're going to have to put a lot less on your plate and actually do those things over a period of time day after day after day and then you become a person so you know every time i put stuff on my list it gets done maybe i can put a little bit more on my list now but you got to start off slow and hit 100 percent. just feels like a call back to last week with liz who liked to only have the big three she wasn't mm -hmm. going to put a lot of things on her list and the other thing i heard you say like i know me but in a positive way like mondays are good for certain types of activities but not other types right monday is not a good day for writing because i know something about myself about mondays right or i know something about myself about mornings like i hit my sweet spot for creative writing after lunch that's the right time for that so i feel like there's some things where when we know ourselves it gives us a place to build from, not necessarily a place to punish ourselves. But you were saying more things around that, around you know yourself. Well, I think knowing ourselves is really important. And we're more similar to others than we might want to think sometimes. But there, there, are, there are certainly differences too. My, my first coach told me about good brain times and not so good brain times. And, and not just that, but some parts of my day I'm better at certain aspects of it you know I've, I've talked to that about that in some of my classes in the morning um, and and this is where we're all the same very similar in the morning 
about an hour and a half after we get up, we become our most proactive self. That's the time when you can actually tell yourself to do something and actually get it done. That starts at about an hour and a half after we get up and it lasts for about three, three and a half, maybe four hours, tops. And then our proactivity muscle, so to speak, declines. And in the evening, I, I mean, you know, as maybe evidence of that, how many people that are listening right now do their impulsive shopping in the morning? I don't think so. We get on Amazon at four o'clock in the afternoon or, or two o'clock in the morning, right? We get, we get there when we're tired um, and our, our ability to be proactive and make decisions is, is weakened considerably. So for me, I've, I've realized that another aspect of good brain time, I'm, I'm much better at doing academic type work in the morning, right? I'm much better if I have to write a blog, for example, I should do that in the morning. On the other hand, in the afternoons, I'm more diffuse and I have a much better peripheral vision for a subtext of what people are saying. I'm a much more social creature in, in the afternoon. So if I'm gonna have an appointment with somebody, especially a, like a sales appointment or something like that, I wanna have it in the afternoon because I'm just spot on, right? When, when I'm there, that's when my ability to understand and resonate with people is the highest. You know, people in the morning, you know, I, I only wanna hear from people in the morning. Right. Tell me what you need me to know and go away. <laughs> but I'm not a, I'm not much of a social creature in the morning, but I become that way in the afternoon. So learning that part about myself has been pretty valuable. I so we started out saying time management's not about time management. And now I hear you really talking about understanding your own energy mm -hmm. is is really a lot about moving things forward for you. When, when's the right time? When's the sweet spot? Understanding your own your own ebbs and flows, and there are some universals. The thing you said about in the what did you say about two hours after getting up, this is a sweet spot for it's on the plate and it gets done. Um, yep. Right. But but also you're in particular like the uniqueness that is Rick. You know, if it's a social thing where I really am need to be reading your face, that's an afternoon activity. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's no accident. You know, when, when we're when we're dating, we go on dates in the evening. We don't go on dates at 730 in the morning. Right? It just doesn't happen that way for us. So there are certain almost universals. And, you know, this is not about whether you're a morning person or a night person. You know, it's not about that. It, it's about just human rhythms. It's the way it works for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so funny you say that about you go on a date at night. So I there was a time where I had a night job and. Uh, I had two days off right from my night job. That's when I went on my blind date. So I could go at the right time for social things. Yeah, who's going, you know, coffee dates, womp, womp, right? I did a few of those, but that's, they all ended up like that, womp, womp. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think we're more, in a sense, we're more focused in the morning. And that's, that's good for doing academic things. Like I said, if you have to read a, a report or something, but our minds are more diffuse in the in the afternoons, and that's not a bad thing. That that that's where this ADHD world comes in really happily, actually, for a lot of us is that we have this really wide peripheral view, right? It, it might make it hard to sit in a restaurant and quit listening to the person behind you, right? It's hard to filter all that out, uh, which you could probably filter out very easily in the morning. Um, so it's a little bit hard, but at the same time, that's when you can. You know, you can listen to someone talking and you can read their facial expressions and say, you know, there's something off here. You know, you might not notice that in the morning, but in the evenings, we are more tuned in to all the signals people are giving off, not, not just the words they're putting out. But there's lots of examples of it, but we have a, this wide peripheral vision that pe those of us with ADHD frequently have is most effective in the, in the evenings. And it's most detrimental when you're trying to do something academic so try to do your academic stuff when you don't have that when you have a more of a, a you know singular focus so we have a question in the q a tool which is what about working memory and time management this is i think a, a little out ahead of us but it still seems like a good question for this conversation and um we're not going to open up the mics for questions so please either type them into the chat or into the q a tool thank you very much well, I want to hear a little bit more about what Vicky meant by that question. Um, I, I will say that with ADHD, a known aspect of it is that um, 
short-term memory, working memory, there's a tape that plays in our head, and let's just say it's roughly seven seconds long. When someone says something to you, you have seven seconds to do something with it, to work with it, to see how it applies to other things in your life, and that, or to file it away in long-term memory, or to have it just get overwritten and you never see it again, right? If someone gives you a phone number and you don't repeat it to yourself a few times to file it away, or you don't write it down, it will be lost, right? It's not in there. It's a myth that our brain stores everything that ever happened. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, so things will get overwritten. So I myself find that um, I, if I want to do something and suddenly something else occurs to me that I want to remember, I'd better pull my tablet out and write it down because otherwise it's, it's, it's not there anymore. And I might remember three days later, but then it's, oh, what, 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 I thought of that three days ago. Why didn't I deal with it? So I, that type of memory gets overwritten. Um, there's another type of memory. I was talking with uh, Ari Tuckman. I wasn't, a bunch of people were hanging around. So um, he was talking about the kind of memory that happens when you're, you're cooking sausage and eggs on the, on the stove in the kitchen, and then you wanna go load the laundry machine. So you go do that. There's another kind of memory that needs to be triggered to remind you to go back in and get the eggs off the stove and then to remind you to go back and stop the, the water flowing in the, in the laundry lab, you know, the, the, the tub there. So that's another kind of memory. And yeah. that's, a, that's a weakness for people with ADHD because we get so focused into what we're doing that we completely forget that we were cooking something on the stove. Um, and yeah, that remembering to remember that is an Ari Tuckman from his workbook thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. Ari Tuckman, I recommend anything that he writes. He's really good. So um, I, rather than, you know, this is a pet peeve of mine, but rather than say, oh my gosh, I can't do that. I've got time blindness. I've got this lifelong issue going on. Rather than that, it's, it's healthy to realize that we have it and then say, okay, now what am I going to do about it? It, it? it, you know, we are who we are. And if you have a hard time remembering certain things, then find a way around that, you know, write them down, record them, set an alarm, whatever it takes. There's all kinds of aids that we can use to help us with those kind of things. There are a lot of aids, but that remembering to remember, especially like we put something on the stove. So we're fortunate, like if we put a tea kettle on and the kettle tells us it's boiling. But <laughs> if you've ever put eggs on in a pot, that's now, oops, you know, now you have rubbery eggs. <clears throat> and that has happened a few times around here. And then for a small amount of money, I bought a countertop egg cooker and it makes a big noise when the eggs are done so you yep. know what how to can we doesn't we do not always need a technology solution i do have a kitchen timer that whenever i'm making cookies for example i know i'm very particular i want them seven minutes in the oven i use this timer all the time for that um so external tools no shame in that want to have the cookies come out right uh, I see some other interesting things in the chat. Um, I saw a couple I wanted to answer too. Please, so I'm not sure which please. ones you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to just yeah. let you go then. But, yeah. but you, you did say something about uh, no shame in that. There's really no shame in any of this. I don't know where it got pasted on somewhere, but, but it's, there's no reason. If we have a time management problem, that's just part of who we are. Just like, you know, I wear glasses, right? There's no shame in that. The fact is the glasses help me, so I wear them. So... You know, we've got to get out of this idea that we have a lifelong deficit the pathology. We're not disordered, right? We have certain, maybe you might call them weaknesses, and we need to shore those up with, with a timer, right? There's a lot of ways to shore that up, um, but we also have a lot of strengths, too. I'm amazed, and, and this is where the negative stuff comes, comes in, I guess. I'm amazed how many people will say, I can't ever get somewhere because I've got time blindness, but then they won't even give credence to the idea that they're a fantastic artist, for example, right? It's, it's this negative stuff, the painful stuff, I understand. But, you know, we have strengths and weaknesses, all of us, every, every person on the planet. But this is interesting about the time blindness, right? It could be very hard to get to an appointment, a doctor's appointment, work. But I have this one friend who's a musician and he gets the time on time weekly to this meeting he has with his bandmates. And so his wife said to him, hey, you've got no problem with that thing. So what can you take from this thing that's already working and move it over to these other things, right? Yeah. I mean, there's something about that. Um, I, I don't want to step over this other thing that's in the chat. 
about being in a restaurant, having a lot of noise. I, I, I just, just, just this week was listening to a thing on auditory processing disorder and how it is not about the hearing, it is about the processing. And there is some very easy therapy for that and that it co-occurs a lot with ADHD. And I know that that happens in this house, not just myself, but other people in this house will, you think it registered, but it didn't. So when I was a working person, I had a habit of saying back to my boss exactly what they said to me. Then we both knew that I understood and heard that that does another no shame. Hey, Rick, when's that thing we're doing? Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Okay, I'll see you. Do you have it in your calendar? Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, There's no shame in that. I mean, that's just... Yeah, and the shame doesn't do anything. It's like worry, right? It's a completely useless and, and detrimental thing. Worry doesn't help you. All worry does is make you suffer twice for the same problem, right? So Amen. it does absolutely nothing in terms of solving the problem. So I wanted to... Um, Patrick, quite a while ago, I don't know, um, not too long, five minutes ago, he asked a question about college uh, and work without taking medication. I think it really depends about the person. I can tell you for sure, if I had known about this and I had medication, I would have done a whole lot better in school. There's, there's no doubt about that. I think we can get through. I mean, I did. I, I didn't get through well. <laughs> I just got through. But, uh, you know, I, I think we do the best we can with the information we have at the time. And we know at this point that mainstream, not these alternative things, you know, and you go try what you want to try, but we know that mainstream medication combined with behavior modification, combined with a ADHD friendly living environment is the best path to success. And I see people in my, some of my chat groups that come in, it's like Groundhog Day. They, they you know, three weeks later, they're trying some other alternative thing. And I say, you know, this, this, this ADHD is really making a mess out of your life. Don't you think it's important enough to take mainstream medication that's been proven to work? You know, and I, I don't really want to get snarky with people, but I'm really, I don't understand. All right. If you know something will do something for you, why wouldn't you do it? Minimal side effects. I'm not saying medication works for everybody, but it's the one thing that's proven to work something like 80% of the time. But that's just it. It's 80%. So there is 20% of people for whom it's not going to work or they have like a medical thing. They had a stroke. They have high blood pressure. It's not. So there's, I mean, and that's why ADD was around before it got a name and people found remedies and solutions. So Socrates talked about but it. I, you and I have always been on the same page about if there's something you could do for yourself, like I, you know, you're blurry now, but I, I'd like to be able to read these words without suffering. So that's why I wear the glasses. That's I right. could make them out, but it would take me a lot longer and be fatiguing. And that's where I don't, I mean, I know it is, but I don't know where a character got associated. People don't think anything less of a person's character when they wear glasses. They just think, hey, you know, they need glasses. They're not stupid. They're going to wear glasses, right? So why wouldn't people take medication? I understand it doesn't work for everybody. Glasses don't work for everybody. You know, I might have had some other problem, which is why I went in and got my eyes properly diagnosed. You know, maybe there's glaucoma going on. Maybe there's something else. Get a full diagnosis. And they said, what you really need are glasses. And here they are. And, and you know, there it is. It's done. Yes. So I, I, I don't quite understand this this. I don't know, blood purity or something. People want to have their, their blood as pure as spring water or something. If you need the medication, then use it. <laughs> right. I, I see something else in this chat and I, I know we're four minutes beyond this post, but um, no, no, I forget to set the timers. Of course, you know, that, that happens. We, you know, we be in the real world. We yep. get a rhythm when we start to use something over and over again. And, you know, one tray of cookies comes out burnt because I forgot the timer. It's just one tray right? I still have the rest of the batch to make. Um, and then I see the next comment is I've been ashamed to carry around a notepad. So mm -hmm. I used to, when I went to the gym, have, have this shame about, I wanted to count my reps and keep tabs of what I was doing. And I didn't understand how all the other people were walking around and just, I don't know, they knew what they were, how did they keep it in their mind? And I sort of looked goofy for a long time but I wanted to keep track and know my progress and what was I doing. Um, so sometimes you just have to march to your own beat. Um, and, you know, I, 
I'm empowering you. I hope that you're empowered to march to the beat of your own drum. You have to do what works for you, right? Yeah, and, you know, there's so much there to unpack. But a big problem with ADHD is we, we have a facade and we're afraid that someone will find out who we really are, how disorganized we are, how whatever it is, you know, how, how what's going on. And we get into this kind of fake it till you make it kind of thing. And I can pretty well guarantee you, if you keep faking it, you won't make it, right? Because you're not even being yourself. I mean, how can you? Um, so I will say, you know, just a little thing from my history, I was diagnosed, I guess, probably 25 years ago or 26. Um, I started carrying around one of these rather large zip up binders, right? It would hold all my papers and I could throw things in. I could zip it up so they wouldn't fall out and stuff. I actually took the thing into a movie theater one time and, and somebody said, what are you doing with that? You don't need that. And I said, well, actually I do because I need to write things down when I think of them. Otherwise I might not know them again, right? And if something's going on in my work life or something, I need to write it down because I don't trust that I will remember that when I come out of the theater. Now, I don't think I ever wrote anything when I was in the theater, but I got in the habit of carrying that thing everywhere. And some people did give me a little bit of a hard time, I'm jokingly, of course, but you know, if I was overly sensitive, it wouldn't have felt like a joke to me. But I just said, my, this is my life right now, it's a mess. There's my life over there that I wanna to get to. How am I gonna get there? This zip up binder that you think is unnecessary, I'm, I believe it's a very valuable tool for me. You know, and, and now, you know, my zip up binder is in my phone, right? But I still carry something so that I can jot notes down so I won't forget them. Because it literally, it, you know, I, we got to get out of this idea that we're operating at a deficit or disorder. But the fact is, I don't necessarily process things. And if I don't write them down, I, I don't think I have a weaker memory. I don't think in general people do. They have a poor filing system, which means it's hard to pull it up when you want it. But what, what happens with me is someone will say something and then all of a sudden I'm paying attention to something else and that seven second tape gets overwritten and I will swear they never said it to me. I'm absolutely positive they didn't say it to me. So I realize that I need to write things down. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna do it. There's no shame. It's in it. so interesting what you say about the thing getting overwritten and it can happen like this. I mean, my husband and I live here in Southern California. He is a car nut. He just loves cars. And really that you can't even get down our street without seeing something interesting to him. If we were having a conversation that he would need to recall, like, hey, we're doing something in two or three days and I need you to take the dry cleaning. And then we drive past uh, Aston Martin or anything, right? A Dodge uh, that's interesting to him. Look, that thing is lowered and has four wheel drive. You know, that anything I said was lost because yeah. the car is so much more interesting. Um, but this thing about writing it down and saying it out loud, and then I see in the chat, a lot of people talking about going to the doctor and not necessarily getting it, that there's that advice about bringing someone with you. I mean, if the doctor says, blah, 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 bad news, who can hear anything after that? You're just in your head about the bad newsness of it, right? Um, bringing someone with you who can maybe remember. And there is a lot more with the electronic records where you can see what the doctor said to you out loud that, that there's a written. Um, and this is really a best practice. People learn many, many different ways. Um, yep. But to have it written down is something you can refer to over and over. That's the whole point of written language, right? Yeah, that's a real thing with the doctor. I mean, I'm not sure where someone wrote that, but my mom in her later years, she had a couple of different types of cancer and, and someone would go with her all the time to the doctor. And yeah, she didn't have any kind of dementia whatsoever, but she would not remember what that doctor said because it's, it's too much noise in her head, right? There's so much stuff going on. So, and, yeah. and someone just posted about Otter. Otter is a wonderful thing. Otter.ai, it's a wonderful thing. It will record your conversations. It'll transcribe your conversations. It's it's so easy to use. Um, and, and I think it's, it, it is really important. And another thing about writing it down, just real briefly, I was um, working on joining a partnership some, some years back and a friend of mine took me aside kind of and said, you know, Rick, because I was always interrupting. I was interrupting largely because I was afraid I'd forget what I was going to say or somehow I thought it was really urgent. And he said, you know, we were always on the phone. He just said, write it down. You know, have a notepad, write it down. And then you can sit on your hands. You'll be more, you'll be okay. Sit there for a while. It was amazing how that kept me from wanting to interrupt because I wasn't afraid I would forget it because I wrote, you know, just three or four words about what I was trying to remember to say. 
And it was also amazing to me how often I didn't have to say it. That, that was a big, big eye-opener. And, and if I had said it, I wouldn't have looked as professional or, or as competent as if I sat on my hands for a few minutes and realized, oh, I didn't have to say that. There's another saying, and I, and I say, say this probably too much, but there's a saying that says, um, what, what is it? Do, does it have to be said? Do I have to say it? And does it have to be said right now? And if it doesn't hit all three of those things, if you're in a meeting, it doesn't hit all three of those things, you don't need to say it, right? If it doesn't have to be said now, it doesn't have to be said by you. I mean, whatever the three things are, I've already forgotten. <laughs> but the, you, you really have to put these things through a triage because when we're in meetings, we frequently were afraid that we will forget what we were going to say, or we, you know, we want to look good, so we want to say something in the moment we have it. Um, generally speaking, in meetings, you look better if you're the last person to talk, not the first. Truer words were never spoken. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. coming in at the end with a with something that uh sums it all up definitely definitely earns a lot of points with people i do see something in the chat that i'd like to not let get past me and i did see there's something in the uh, q a tool um the main issue this reading uh is that some of the adhd meds are famous for being abused for performance enhancing uh so yeah, eyeglasses don't have shame attached to them. They don't have, um, and there are a lot of people and in college, there are a lot of professors who think that ADHD isn't real or that the kids are trying to get some advantage. The, I don't disagree with you that those things are, there is in the zeitgeist, those things. Um, so we can feel judged. I, I have to say I'm a caretaker and I pick up my mother's medications and I have to go in two or three times whenever I'm picking up my own medications because they're ADD meds and they can't refill them automatically and they need a new script and all these other things. And I, I, although I don't have shame around it, it certainly is noticeable how we're treated differently. I, I, you'd have to really not be looking to not notice that. So I don't disagree that being in the world requires a thick skin um, when we're looking to help our own selves and be, be a stand for ourselves, advocate for ourselves. Yeah, I don't think we should necessarily wear ADHD on our sleeve because it's the biggest thing that we've come across and a big aha moment. It, it isn't that way for everybody else. So we don't necessarily want to wear it on our sleeve, but we also shouldn't be embarrassed to talk about it. And I, I, my kind of rule of thumb is I tell people what I think they need to know. If I'm, if I'm working in an office building and they've got me in front by the receptionist and I say, you know, I could do a better job for you if you put me in the back where it's quiet. I'm just telling them I'm distracted. I don't need to say I have ADHD, which might be an entirely different picture for them. They may not, they may not have the same idea of what that means. Um, I wanted to address um, anonymous attendee there on the question. Um, I absolutely think that clutter uh, and disorganized spaces uh, infect our mind as well. I think it's no doubt that, and, and this was something that was kind of an eye opener to me, but I realized that when I was really overwhelmed and anxious, you know how you get a little shaky maybe because there's a lot of adrenaline going through your system, whatever, my handwriting would get horrible. I mean, it's, it's never good, but it would get where I couldn't even read it two seconds after I wrote it, right? In fact, I have some notes like that here. <laughs> but the what I realized, um, and, and I, I think I read this somewhere and then I tried it. When I would write something in that state of mind and I would take really careful and write form my letters and make it right, it actually worked in reverse and my mind settled down. So it not only was my mind making my handwriting awful, when I worked consciously to make the handwriting better, my mind got a little bit more, more stable and focused. So I'm, I think I'm kind of a minimalist. I, I think that we have so much clutter we don't need needless clutter in our lives. We should get rid of it. We, there's so much stuff we have that we are never going to need. We somehow think we, we have to have it and we don't. Um, yeah, I would remove as much clutter and make things clear. And, and then, yeah, and I think it has a big effect. And, and it's also maybe the clutter is a symptom as well, right? I think sometimes when we are disorganized and kind of discombobulated in some way, then it makes perfect sense that we wouldn't put our stuff where it belongs, that it would start laying all over the house. And the best way to get rid of clutter, by the way, I, I'm a total believer in this, is not to hire some 
some uh, you know organizer to come in and just do it for you. I don't think that's going to work. Uh, it'll clean the house up for sure, and you could pay them every month to do it again. But the best way to really change your identity and your mindset is to simply say, you know what? Every time I come in the house, I'm putting whatever I have in my hand where it belongs. And every time I use something, I, I find it on the floor, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to put it back where it belongs. If you start putting everything back where it belongs that you use, your whole house will clean up. And the things that, are, that aren't cleaning up are the things you don't use. You might as well get rid of them. So I, I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not a great advice. Yeah. We we don't change our behavior by making these sweeping revolutionary things of, you know, let's let's have a pizza party and get everybody over here to clean up my house, right? That might work if you're trying to sell the house, but if you want to keep your house permanently clean, you have to change who you are. But it's interesting what you say about having a place for things. There was a point in time where I, I can't, it was definitely a different rental than where we're living right now where there was sort of like I don't my husband said I don't really have a place where I put my wallet when I get home right um and we didn't have a place for keys so that's I got a bowl I got something that that's where keys go um we had a place where the dog leash went why wouldn't we have a place where our keys went um so sometimes to organize right to for it to be a way, we, we might need to get some place for a thing to live, right? Uh, that now you know the knives go in the knife drawer because there's a drawer where knives go, right? But if you haven't set up that, where is the place, right? Finding the place for things. Yeah. yeah. My, my, this is just a really common expression, but my grandma used to say, you know, a place for everything and everything in its place. If you don't have a place for it, it's obviously not going to go in its place. You're just going to set it down on the kitchen counter or something. Um, and if we become more minimalist and we have less junk lying around, it's a lot easier because you have fewer places that need to have a place. Um, and this is not easy. I, I struggle with this stuff too. I, I, you know, it's not easy. But if we become mindful, uh, it, it does get better. And back to that original question, it absolutely impacts our ability to focus. If you've got clutter all over the place, it's impacting you. So um, we answered some questions that were off the beaten path. Um, let's come sort of back to our main thrust of getting to the root, the root of moving a thing from this time management tool to the other or from the to-do list or a calendaring, it's still not getting done. So when we're looking to get to the root, the, is it an emotional root? Is it a, how do, how am I going to move forward root? What, what do you, where are we, where are we going next? Well, I think it depends on the person and the situation, of course, but a lot of these things that aren't resolving, that aren't getting done, that we really would like to have done, um, and we really do, consciously, we really want them done, but there's pieces underneath that, that are much more powerful than that. I, I think becoming mindful, and not just of the task, not just of the thing that we're trying to do, but becoming mindful of how we feel when we're about to get off the rails, right? Th these things don't happen on quote unquote impulse, right? There are always precursors to everything that we do as a human being. So if we can look back farther upstream and say, you know what, I'm feeling really anxious about this thing and I don't wanna do it. And you know what, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. We should look back an hour and say, well, what was I feeling before that happened? And what was happening the day before? And why did I decide I really want this thing? Um, so if we can get in touch with how we're feeling and, and I think that's a huge issue because I think most of us are very out of touch with how we feel very out of touch we get the big stuff right we we get the big stuff but we have emotions all the time coursing through us and maybe we're anxious but it's like a fish in water we're anxious all the time and we don't even notice it anymore well we need to begin to notice it because it's that anxiety i i like the weather system metaphor right i people have heard this before but if you have a weather system in a high pressure area and that could be the task that you're kind of resisting you don't really know. It's just high pressure area, right? It's a little tiny bit on the on the barometer. But if there's a low pressure area somewhere, which is cleaning out the garage instead of doing this tedious and dull thing, you're going to go from the high pressure to the low pressure. It's just natural. We are we're we're part of the physical universe, right? If there's something that's high pressure and there's something else that's lower pressure, unless you have a good reason to keep you in that high pressure zone, 
you're going to go to the lower pressure. So unless there's a really good reason and people don't see things in the future as a really good reason, they say, oh, that's not now. I don't have to worry about that, right? It might be a really good reason if, if the thing they have to turn in today causes them you know, to save $500 if they turn it in by three o'clock, they probably will do it. But if it doesn't have to happen today, it can happen in some undefined time in the future, probably not going to happen at all. So we need to get in touch with how we feel about these things. I think that's the biggest thing. And when you get in touch with how you feel about it, then you can start to say, you know, maybe I can, in some cases, I can sit with it. You know, another analogy, another thing I like to say is, I might be hungry right now, and you know, I'm not, but I can sit here. It, hunger is a pain I can live with. I can sit here for the rest of the duration of this, and then maybe if I have something else coming up in an hour, I can sit there for that, and I can go get something to eat in two hours. I do not have to disrupt my life to go get something to eat just because I feel a little bit hungry. So when we become familiar and in touch with how we feel, then we can say, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm anxious, but you know what? This is important to me. I'm going to stick it out. But if we don't know it's the anxiety pushing us aside, we're just, we're helpless because we're blindsided. We don't know. All we know is we're not doing it again. So then we feel guilt and shame and everything else. So I feel like I'm hearing <clears throat> mood repair. Like if we can notice it and sit with it, then yep. we have some facility. We have some, uh, when it's not named and it's, out there away from us and we're just avoiding it right but so getting in touch with what are you feeling that mm -hmm. that helps us get closer to action you know not just um and i did see people put path of least resistance when you use that high pressure low pressure metaphor which is terrifically helpful um well and, so and, would you call it that is mood repair yes sound? absolutely okay. I, absolutely mood emotion you know we want to feel better and that's just natural we're we're in a state of equilibrium whether we like where we are or not we are in a state of equilibrium all the choices all the forces acting upon us in the universe everything that's happened in what's in our head outside of our head we're in a state of equilibrium and if we want to move somewhere we have to change the equilibrium we we have to cut things that are holding us back we have to strengthen things that will drag us forward and we have to set a new set point for ourselves Otherwise, you know, we might get out of that state of equilibrium for a little while by self-discipline, but we will move back to where, you know, all the forces are equalized again. So, and I see Heather put something about the quick start guide. You know, I'm actually pretty proud of that quick start guide. So it's, I don't, maybe someone can tell everybody how to get that. If you're not a Renify member, it's still available. You just have to give us your email address, yeah. but which yeah. you already have because you're in here. Um, so you should I will, be able to- uh, I'll, I'll do a quick look and maybe you, someone else in the room if you if you have that quick start guide and you remember the link for it that would yeah. be terrifically helpful i will take a sneaky peek i i also wanted to say um i see the last chatter in here saying um it, i find it hard to notice what i'm feeling when i've got resistance to the task yeah. um and i feel like when we talked about what were we gonna talk about today there was this overcoming the internal resistance and what does that look like and even noticing that we have some resistance that that was a step forward to have some notice happening is some awareness is is already we're a step ahead of i just don't know what it is but i'm not doing it right yeah yeah no absolutely i'm, I'm reminded this might seem a little off topic but it's not um back when i was in college fritz pearls did some some um seminar type things in, in S1. And I never, I, I re, it's one of those regrets, right? I was contemporary with him and I never went down there to, to see any of his stuff in the, in the early seventies. But he did this um, thing with people where they would peel an orange in the room. And maybe some of the people in this room are familiar with that. They'd peel an orange and he would kind of walk them through all the different sensations. And people were in tears because they peeled oranges a thousand times before but they had never actually experienced peeling an orange, right? They were peeling the orange while talking to someone or whatever, because they were intent on getting to the fruit inside. They never actually experienced it, right? Just because you do something doesn't mean you're actually experiencing it. So I think that's a really powerful thing. We need to get in touch with who we are. And one of the ways to do that, I'm not a meditator, but I believe that is a good way to do it, is to sit quietly and let these things rise to the surface. They're, they're soft. And if you're always busy doing something else, you're not going to feel it. You're not going to know it. 
in fact, that's one reason people stay busy because they're afraid they don't want to feel, right? There's a certain fear there too. So sitting with ourselves and saying, you know, what am I really feeling right now? And taking some time and say, okay, and is that okay? Is that a bad feeling? And, and I don't I don't know that you can really put things as good or bad feelings. They, they are what they are. Obviously they can impact us in different ways. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's really important. So thanks uh, for putting the link in there about the quick start guide and for mentioning it. So I'm just going to highlight here. I know Rick finished a sentence and I'm sort of a slight detour tangent, which is to say, how do you know? I, I like to say what I notice and how I notice that I'm in the right place and people helping me find a thing, making it easy for me, uh, sharing their knowledge with me, uh, watching out for me when they know maybe that I about to trip right over something this is how i know i'm in the right space with the right people and so when i see really nice advice really trustworthy this is what worked for me um, in the chat or people helping by putting the links in the chat this i this is how i know renify is the right place for me because that's what i want in a community so I'm just pointing that out. Hopefully this is what, <laughs> what appeals to everyone who's a Renify member about Renify. Um, thanks for putting the links. All right. Um, so this, we, we talked about this overcoming our internal resistance. Um, I wanted to ask you about, and we, so you talked about awareness. Um, I, I feel like there's a kind of a dopamine hit for people with problem solving versus remembering, which is a little more taxing, maybe. Um, do you have some shorthand questions you use with yourself or that maybe you'll be in uh, a space that's a co-working space or something where you'll talk to some friend and say, hey, I'm still having trouble doing that, writing that post what did I do last time? Do you remember? How, how, do you, is there someone you trust to help you work through those kind of things? Somewhat, somewhat. Yeah, I, I belong to three different business groups and they're all kind of on hiatus with the uh, COVID, you know, kind of interrupted a lot of things. But those groups, I'm able to, you know, go talk to people and they become my friends and I can kind of float trial balloons about something I might want to do with my business or whatever, or, or whatever. We don't talk about ADHD too much, although it has come up. Um, but I can float that trial balloon rather than floating it with my staff or any of the Renify members, for example, because some things, you know, like, I don't know, like, like saying you're gay, once you say it, you can't take it back, right? It's just out there. So I'm able to say things about my business to those people. And it doesn't go any farther than that if I don't want it to. Um, so I think that's, that's one good thing is to have people that you trust. And sometimes it should be compartmentalized. I mean, that's what mine is with my business group. I say stuff it's not going to go, it's not going to show up in Ratify because those people aren't Ratify members, right? Oh, actually two of them are, <laughs> but, but they know. So, so I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, the dopamine hit and the endorphins and all the different things, that's all chemical reactions, cascades in our head that are incredibly important. You know, I don't know how you feel about it spiritually, but the fact is we're mechanical beings. There, there are things going on in there, just like running a car. There are things that are going on. And if they're not functioning correctly, that car is not going to run very well. And, you know, bring this back to something earlier, but mainstream medication, behavior modification, and a ADHD friendly and living, living environment, that's the equivalent of tuning up your car. Um, so we need to make all those things work. Um, and that doesn't mean it's a magic cure. It just means you're developing a good baseline um, for things. And, you know, another baseline is sleep, diet, and exercise. You need mm. to get those things under control because those things will exacerbate ADHD, especially the sleep especially the sleep. Yeah, set a ton there. Um, I just wanted to circle back to something else from the chat, which was, um, I'm just going to read. I like, uh, I've heard that when you're resisting, maybe you want to check in and see if you're hungry, thirsty, angry, tired. Um, so do a self check. So this using something about yourself to notice and do a self-awareness like what's going on over here i mean anything we can do to bring some more awareness because i i think i just heard you say rick that we're not always that in touch with our body I, I feel like if we're really enjoying the thing we're working on the computer game we're playing 
anything, we could say, I am not getting up to go to the bathroom until I'm about to wet myself, or I am not going to um, go get a glass of water because I'm enjoying this thing so much. Uh, and, and it's completely unconscious. And then by the time we notice it, we're ravenously hungry, right? We're going to eat something junky, or we really have to make a mad dash to the can. Yeah, I think there's two things going on there. I think transitions are tough for us, right? There's no doubt. And we lose a lot of, there's a lot of friction between one thing and the next. So I think in some ways we, we almost want to be hyper-focused on something because we just know if we let go and go do, go have lunch, we'll never get back to it. So it is, a, and that's why we get really upset when someone starts to tap us on the shoulder and interrupt us because we're afraid if we lose that focus, we may not get back. It's one of the reasons anyway. Um, I, I think there's another aspect to what you said. And going back again to, I think we're like a fish in water, right? The fish doesn't know the water until there's a problem with the water. We, we don't understand anything about the air. We, we're not conscious of the air until there's a problem with the air supply. Then we get become conscious of it very quickly. So I think, I, I guess another way, I, I hear people in my um, sport clinics at, at Chad actually, and they take their medication and they suddenly say, oh, now I feel normal. Well, that doesn't resonate with me because they don't know what normal is. They've always been the fish in that water. Now they're in a different water. How do they know that that's normal? All they know is that it's different than what they had before. And what really counts is, is it working, right? It, you don't know what someone else feels. And I don't know what, uh, in some movie I saw, you know, I don't know what chicken tastes like to you. All I know is what it tastes like to me. And so if you gave me turkey, it's, oh, this is what it's supposed to taste like. No, I don't know. All I know is it's something different. So medication, is really important. You know, I can't stress it enough. Uh, I don't want to be pill pusher. I think we should do what the, the least amount that, that works, right? That's, a, that's another thing about medication. Just because 10 milligrams works doesn't mean you need 40. It's not going to do any better. Um, so I just, we should do what works. That's what it really comes down to. Whatever, whatever is working for us and not worry about what's, you know, what other people are going to think about it. It's, it's a, this is what's great about community, right? When you're with other people who get it, when you say how you're feeling, that that resonates with them. And also, you know, it's not the gospel. It's what works for that person. It might work for you. It might work if you try it and then tweak it, right? I've heard somebody talking about um, eating a high protein breakfast, which sounded great to me, but they wanted to eat, you know, uh, avocado toast and an egg. Well, I'm, I'm not that keen on toast. So I just made the egg part, but there was enough about what that other woman had shared about how she made it easy to have breakfast that was usable for me. So being around other people who relate, you can relate to, relate to you and the way we were thinking, this community thing can really bring things forward and, and reveal strategies and tools that might work, might work better than what you're doing now. And, and I don't mean to say that there aren't, some of the alternatives can work, right? They may not be proven. And, and that's, that's a big problem, I think, especially if it's, I don't know, you could probably go to some other country and get cancer treatment and it might actually work, but I would rather go to mainstream Western medicine if that's what, where I'm at, right? I would rather take, take that. I'd rather have the person, you know, with the 30 years of, of experience. So I think there's that, but that doesn't mean that things like um, high protein breakfast and, and getting a lot of exercise and doing meditation, for example, it doesn't mean those things don't work, right? You can use those in conjunction with it for sure. What it means is if you forego the treatments that are pretty much proven to have good efficacy in favor of, you know, one of the latest ones I heard in one of my chat groups was some light therapy thing. I don't even know what, I, you know, I tuned out. I didn't even listen to the whole thing. But, and it was one of those people who's been coming to my group for 20 years, 20 years. It's Groundhog Day. He's just got another thing, right? So, yeah. But he won't take mainstream medication because he's, I don't know, he's anti-big pharma or something. I don't know what it is. But, but there is a lot of novelty seeking right yeah oh yeah and no, it's no. not to say that that thing might not be work but they're they, this is the thing we were talking about before about you know we have a unique each of us does have unique qualities and so one size fits all strategies the nike of the world just do it that doesn't resonate with us but 
investigating, trying, testing, yeah. learning what works for us. And then remembering, that's the other thing. Like you could dis discover this is what works for me. And next week you forgot it. And then it's kind of erased. And unless, you know, I bump into Rick and go, I, I don't understand why I, this isn't working. I feel like last week I got exercise and he goes, yeah, but last week, remember what we did is we did it together. I sent you a ping and then we both took a walk. Oh, I forgot all about that. That's how we did it. Yeah. Right. Or maybe you, I sent myself my own automated ping, right? But, but getting in touch with what works for us and then being able to recreate it. Um, so I, w before we step away, I, you've got something on the tip of your tongue. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I do. I do. And, and, you know, it's it triggered in my own way, but I, I believe words are really important. And, you know, as many of you know, we're kind of delving into this DEI field, trying to get ready for something in November and, and a couple of things further down the road than that. So Jane put something in there about being a different ability as opposed to a disability. I think words are really important. So someone on the outside might not be triggered by those words whatsoever, but someone that's dealing with it every day, it really means something. So I think we need to be careful. And if words are bothering someone, triggering that we need to accept that. We just need to, you know, accept that that's the fact for them. It may not bother us, but if it's bothering them, then we should wake up and, and you know, treat them with some respect. Yeah. In, in the same vein, but not the same conversation, I see something else in the chat about some people think the medications will fix everything. And I ha had my gallbladder out and my mother started to have problems, digestive problems, she's another 38 years older than me. And I said, this isn't gonna solve, the gallbladder out didn't solve the problems. The, I had to make a lifestyle change about how much, you know, there's just no fried foods in my life anymore. Mm -hmm. And so she's of that generation. She did get the gallbladder out, you know, and then the lifestyle change came because it, it has to come, otherwise you're suffering. Yeah. Right. So this idea in Western culture that we can just do one thing, we can bring the car to the mechanic like this is a car and get some work done and then magically problems are, are going to go away. I mean, how we take care and maintain this thing is significant into how it runs. We will always have problems. The question is, are we going to take steps to to help with that? Um, I medication alone. And this this was part of my earlier journey when I, I you know, didn't realize how much medication was important, but people would take medication and, you know, this is my early days with Chad, and then it would work really well for like two or three or maybe four months, and then it would stop working. And part of it is the biochemical acclimation to it, right? Part of it. But the other part of it, really the bigger part is that, hold on one second. So the other part that's bigger than that is that our, that, that idea of set points, we are where we are. And if I take some medication and it moves me over somewhere, right, away from this place into that place, my mind has 70 years at this point of keeping me in that place. The medication pulled me over. My mind, all those neural pathways are going to bring me back to the center line for my original set point if I don't do something. If I don't engage in behavior modification, if I don't improve my living environment, if I don't get my sleep, whatever it is that's, that's out of alignment, if I don't do those things proactively, the medication will stop working. You, you know, you might get two or three months out of it, but it, it's, you know, it's a waste. Mm -hmm. But the, what I believe the medication does initially, it gives you a little more ability to work on these problems. It gives you a little bit more ability to be proactive and such. And then long term, it balances out the brain chemistry. It, it doesn't mean we won't have problems. Everybody on the planet has problems. So let's do one more thing. Let's add one more finishing touch, the Melissa finishing touch, which is the show your work. So is there a anything, uh, something that you use to manage yourself or a habit or a hobby, something that you do that is sh that shows your work? So, so we see you, you arrive here. I know you talked about your calendar a little bit. So some other habit or, or thing that you do that, you know, keeps, keeps it working right for you, Rick, that you can share with us and act, sort of show your work like, oh, yeah. look, this thing that you don't see that makes it so my mood is good. I, I don't know what it is. I, I'm, I'm waiting to hear. 
Well, <laughs> well, it's a variety of things, and, and I won't be able to remember them all because I have the short-term memory of goldfish, but um, hiking is one of the big ones. If I go on long walks, I, I, I'm kind of a, it, this is a bell curve kind of thing, but I'm kind of an introvert that's learned how to act like an extrovert because I, I want to be in business and, you know, and I don't want to work in a windowless room doing paperwork, right? So I have to talk to a lot of people. So I find that recharging my batteries, but then conversely, I find that working with other people and engaging other people in my life is really huge. When I get isolated, I go down my own rabbit holes and weeks can go by and nothing really gets done. But if I'm working with other people, like in these three business groups I was talking about, or, or my Renify team or, or you know, Renify members when I, when I have classes, when I am engaging with people, all the cylinders start to work. It all starts to fire. Um, so I would say, and, and I was listening to Ned Hollowell, he's doing a book signing, and he said that, you know, the, the sense of connection that people get from groups like Chad and Ada is worth more than worth all the, the, you know, as much as the therapy and medication combined. It's a really amazing thing for a high level psychiatrist to say. He wasn't saying don't take medication. He wasn't saying any of that. He was simply saying that a big part of our lives, since we're social creatures, that's how we've evolved, means we need to avoid becoming isolated. And that takes effort. You know, lots of people, they want to, they you know, they feel shame or embarrassed or whatever. And, and it does take effort. Every social relationship I've ever had, I believe, I felt like I had to put in more energy than the other person. I believe that's somewhat of an illusion. And I think most people feel that way, but we have to fight through that and we have to put the effort in. But it's, there is a lot to be said for feeling like you have community. The, these folks are like me, these are my folks, right? Uh, I grew up in the New York area and I never really felt related to those teams. But when I moved to Massachusetts, I am still a Red Sox fan and I haven't lived there in 20 years because um, there was something about the way Boston fans love the Red Sox. I felt included. Uh, go Red Sox, you know, Big Puppy just got inducted into the Hall of Fame. See, how, why do I even care about that? But I, I felt accepted there. So this being yeah. around peeps that you feel like this is my peeps, it, it, it really makes a big difference. That, that's so, a place where we're Chad and Ada come in big time, especially Ada. I mean, I've worked with both of them, but Ada is all person to person support groups. They have like 25 or 30 different success clinics. You know, I, I do the Money Matters one. They have like a whole bunch of them. So you can go in there and connect with people who have common threads, right? We're, we're all unique, of course, but we have common threads with ADHD, very much so. Um, and Renify, if I put a little plug in for Renify, I don't. Add is like what, they went up. They were like seven bucks a month last time I checked. I was a little surprised, but that's still dirt cheap compared to what you get from it. And we're 20 bucks, whatever. I don't know, 22, 22.50, I think for a monthly thing and 17 if you do the five month thing. Anyway, it's, yeah. we're worth it. Mm -hmm.